Okay, we'd like to turn to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32, we'll read a very familiar passage, verses 22 through verse 32. And he, and he that's Jacob, rose up that night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook, and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel did not Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. What we have here is a life altering event in the life of Jacob. It's really a record of a face-to-face -face meeting between God and Jacob. At the end of this event, verse 30, we hear Jacob say, I've seen God face-to-face. -face. I have seen God face to face. It's not, I think I saw God. It is, I have seen God. And then he tells how. Face to face. <clears throat> That's a remarkable statement. I have seen God face to face. And that transformed and redefined Jacob. In verse 24, and there wrestled a man with him, that is Jacob, until the breaking of the day. So we see God wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob is resisting the Lord. But by the end of the event, verse 26, Jacob is clinging to the Lord, not willing to let go, pleading with God. So it is an event that brought Jacob from unsurrendered to surrendered from resistance to clinging. Verse 29, the end result is, and he, God, blessed him, Jacob, there. Verse 31 says, and the sun rose upon him, that is Jacob. In other words, it was a new day. It was a new, new day. Now, our purpose in this message is not to 
look at the details of this, of this event, but to simply consider the matter of non-surrender and resistance and surrender. And that's our subject. Non-surrender and resistance or surrender. Which is it? Non-surrender, resistance, or surrender. Jacob is, we all have a lot of Jacob in us. Jacob is Overall, a picture of an unsurrendered life of resistance. Isaac and Rebecca, of course, were the parents of Jacob. And the truth is, their entire household is a picture of unsurrendered lives. And resistance. As a result, it was a household that was filled with trouble. Now you look at the household of Isaac and Rebekah. It's a household filled with trouble. It's a household of uneasiness. It's a household of grief. It's a household of sin. There's a very strong message of warning in the household of Isaac and Rebekah. So when Isaac and Rebekah were expecting twins after 20 years of marriage, God gave the promise to Rebekah that the younger of her twins, her twin sons, which would be Jacob, he would receive the birthright. That was a promise from God. That, of course, was not the usual custom. But if God said that was the way it was going to be, that's the way it was going to be. And God didn't need her help. With the birthright came the headship of the family, a double portion of the inheritance. And it was God's will, it was God's plan for Jacob, the younger, to receive the birthright. So when it came time for Isaac, to confer the blessing of the birthright upon Esau, who was the oldest, Jacob and his mother, unsurrendered to God, instead of trusting God to keep his word, he's promised, Jacob will receive the birthright. Instead of trusting that God would work his will, when it comes time to confer the birthright, since they're not seeing any evidence that this is going to happen, that God's going to confer it upon Jacob, they panic. Why did they panic? Because that's what unsurrendered lives do. They panic. Got a lot of Jacob in us, a lot of Rebecca. Oh, I know what God said, and we, we're in a frenzy. Why is that? Because we're unsurrendered. And then what did they do? Well, they did the same thing we do. They panic, and they begin to plot, and they begin to plan to make sure That, God, that Jacob gets the blessing of the birthright. If God has made a promise, if it's God's will and God's plan, 
You don't have to plot. It's going to happen. And let me tell you something. It's a lot better when we sit back and just wait for God to do it rather than you and I carrying out. Either way, it's going to get done. But one's much easier than the other. So they took matters into their own hands. Why? That's what unsurrendered lives do. They take matters into their own hands in spite of the promise of God. So they make Jacob up like Esau. And Jacob pretends to be Esau. They didn't have to do any of that. God would have fulfilled his promise. Isaac is old. He's half blind. Does not know. And he bestows the birthright upon Jacob. It was all due to unsurrendered lives. And this act of an unsurrendered life created quite a problem. We bring a lot of problems into our lives because we're unsurrendered. It would do us well many times when we have a problem to ask ourselves, why do I have this problem? Now, most people, it would be an exercise in futility because they will not be honest enough to answer the question. But why do I have this problem? Why all of a sudden is the household going to be filled with hatred? Because they're unsurrendered. And they began to plot. And trying to help God out. So when Esau finds out, he's furious. And he promises to kill Jacob. Out of respect for Isaac, he would wait till Isaac was dead. The whole household is now got these problems. This led to the next step of an unsurrendered life. Notice in Genesis 27, verse 43 through 45. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. This is Rebecca speaking to her son Jacob. Arise, Flee thou to Laban, my brother. Why does he have to flee? Well, because Esau is going to kill him. That's not the real reason. The real reason is because Rebecca and I, Rebecca and Jacob plotted, tried to help God out. The real reason is unsurrendered life, which leads to the next step. Verse 44, and tarry with him a few days. She has a plan. Just stay there a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. So she believed that Esau will get over this. And just a few days, Esau will be okay. Unsurrendered lives tell themselves a lot of things to make their lives easier. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him, then I will send and fetch thee from thence, why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? So she has everything planned. She has it all figured out how it's going to work. That's what unsurrendered lives do. They plan. They draw in their picture, in their mind, a picture of how it's going to work. And then when it doesn't work that way, they find someone to blame. Rather than admit, I'm here because I didn't surrender to God. I'm here because I didn't trust God to do what he said he would do. So the plan was for Jacob to be gone for a few days. But it ends up being 20 years. That wasn't in the plan. That wasn't in the plan. The plan was a few days. 
The truth is, Rebecca never saw Jacob again. She died before Jacob got back home. That wasn't the plan. That's not how it was supposed to happen. Oh, had they just left it to God. Jacob would have got the birthright. It would have been a lot easier. So, you think about the pain that was caused by the plans and scheming of unsurrendered lives. And so it is today. So Jacob, he's on his way to his uncle's house. And he has a supernatural experience with God at Bethel in Genesis 28. God was there. The heavens were open. The angels appeared. And God spoke a promise to Jacob. In verses 13 through 15 of Genesis 28. But notice Jacob's response to the province to the promise of God. Verse 20, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me, God just told him I'll be with you. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. What's Jacob doing? He's bargaining with God. Why is Jacob doing that? Because that's what unsurrendered lives do. That's what they do. Really what Jacob is doing is He's trying to be in control. Why? That's what unsurrendered lives do. When Jacob arrives at his uncle Laban's house, he falls in love with his cousin Rachel. And Jacob agrees to work for seven years for the hand of Rachel in marriage. The morning after the wedding, Jacob discovered that his uncle had given him his older daughter, Leah. Jacob the deceiver has been deceived. The message here is be sure your sin will find you out. Well, Jacob agrees to work an additional seven years. Again, this was only supposed to be a few days. That's, that's the plan. That's the plan. So he works an additional seven years for Rachel. And then he works six more years to get his herds. He refused to submit to God at home and ended up submitting to Laban for 20 years. 20 years. What was supposed to be a few day journey, a few day stay, 20 years of submission and labor to Laban. An under surrender life, mark it down, leads to bondage. That's not how you plan it. Oh, I'm going to do this because this will put me in bondage. No, people don't think that way. I'm going to do this because I'll be more free. But unsurrendered lives always leads to a bondage. And it may be a bondage a lot longer than you think. 20 years. After 20 years, Jacob flees the house of his uncle. He does so with Leah and Rachel and their children and their servants and their herds. And he's heading home. For what? 
a better life. <laughs> Isn't that something? He's going back to the place he left for a better life. That's what unsurrendered lives do. They're always looking for a better life. It's been over 20 years since Jacob had last set foot on his father's land. Twenty years since he fled from his brother's wrath. Twenty years since he met God at Bethel. And as Jacob is on his way home, God met him. God meets with Jacob. We see that in Genesis 32. In verse 1, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Jacob, at this time, is filled with uncertainty. He's fearful of his future and safety. When he had left, Esau had threatened to kill him. And Jacob is fearful that Esau might just follow through with this threat. You see, unsurrendered lives lead to great uncertainty and fear. It feeds it. It feeds it. Jacob, entering his brother's land, he sends messengers ahead to meet Esau. The messengers return with word that Esau is headed in the Jacob's direction. And he has 400 men with him. Notice Jacob's response in Genesis 32, 7. Then was Jacob greatly afraid and distressed. Because he makes an assumption. That Esau's on his way to kill him. That's not what Esau was on his way for. But that's the assumption that Jacob made. Unsurrendered lives make a lot of assumptions. And what do assumptions do? They just make you make another foolish decision. You see, this thing never ends. Just an unsurrendered life. Jacob, still living in his own strength, you would think, my mom said I'd only be Uncle Laban's for a few days. It's been 20 years. She was wrong. Doesn't even cross his mind. That's what unsurrendered lives do. They don't think what caused all these problems. So there's Jacob. Still living in his own strength. Hasn't learned a thing. Still trying to manufacture ways. Still trying to make things happen. Still planning. Still plotting. Notice verse 7 and 8. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him. And the flocks and herds and the camels in the two bands. Why? Because he's made an assumption. And said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it. Then the other company which is left shall escape. After 20 years he still has not learned. Didn't ever cross his mind. That it was my planning and scheming that has cost me 20 years. Never crossed his mind. And he's still plotting. Why? That's what unsurrendered lives do. Why didn't he learn? That's what unsurrendered lives do. They just keep on. They continue on. In the process. Jacob prays. Genesis 32. Verses 9. Through 12. It's a good prayer. O God of my father Abraham. And God of my father Isaac, 
The Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the, the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast sold unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou says, I will surely do thee good. God answered his prayer and said, Jacob, I will do thee good. Jacob, trust me. Trust me. And make thy seed the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he prays this prayer. And once again, he gets the assurance. God is saying, Jacob, just trust me. But notice after he prayed, he still had a strategy. He was still plotting. He was still planning, still doing things his way, still doing things according to his own reasoning, still trying to make things happen, even after he prayed. Why? Why was he doing all of this? Because that's what unsurrendered lives do. They'll say, oh, I prayed. Yeah, and what did you do after you prayed? Well, I continued with my strategy and my plotting and my planning. That's what unsurrendered lives do. He sends his servants ahead of him with a gift for Esau. What's he trying to do? God's already told him, Jacob, just trust me. I'm going to take care of this. But Jacob says, I've got to appease Esau. That's what unsurrendered lives do. Always helping God out. So, he sends his servants ahead of him with a gift for Esau. I wouldn't want the gift, but 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, and 30 donkeys. But that's quite a gift in those days. He prayed for God to deliver him. God told him he would. But Jacob still has his plans, still has his schemings to appease Esau. Notice verse 20. And say ye moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me. And afterward I will see his face. You see, he had it all figured out. He's our, he should have learned by now. My plans don't work. What was going to be a few days was 20 years. But now I know when I give these gifts to Esau, Esau will get over it and everything will be fine. And we can continue on. But Jacob, still working all the angles. Why? That's what unsurrendered lives do. You see the answer here to all of this? Surrender. Surrender to God. But unsurrendered lives very rarely get that message. He's still scheming. Still worrying. Still worrying. Worrying himself to death. Why? Why? Well, that's just the way I am. No, here's the way you are. You're unsurrendered. And that's why you worry all the time. Still working. That's what unsurrendered lives do. Most of Jacob's life was identified by non-surrender. And what is non-surrender? It's really resistance against God. It's really resistance against God. Satan's suggestion to Eve was that she and Adam 
could be in charge of their own lives. That's always a lie. That's always a lie. First of all, it's not your life to be in charge of. His suggestion was that they did not have to take direction from anyone. And it would be better. How many times you've heard people say, well, I'm going to do what's best for me. Look at their life. Look at their life. Didn't work. Didn't work. You know why? Because you and I don't know what's best for us. God does. And that's why we're to trust Him. That's why we're to surrender. But Satan has been telling the same lie throughout history. Why does he keep retelling it? Because it works. Because it works. God's people fall for it all the time. As a result, life becomes unfulfilling. And God's people like to blame it on everybody but, the, but themselves. I could count on one hand how many people have ruined their lives and have come to the admission, I did this. No, it's always someone else's fault. Oh, that they had surrendered somewhere along the way. It leads to empty lives with little or no meaning. Lives with no lasting satisfaction. As a result, life is filled with frustration and failure and endless wandering. The solution? Surrender to God. That's the solution. But most of the time, that's not going to happen. Because once you start down that path, there aren't too many examples of people that are brought back. So let's consider the matter of surrender to God. The Word of God teaches us very plainly that we are to give ourselves to God. There is a call for complete surrender to God. In order to do that, we have to come to the end of ourselves, committing, dedicating, submitting, yielding, and confining the totality of our being to God. And that is the teaching of God's Word. That is the teaching of God's Word. People fight against that. I've had people doing marriage counseling, and they won't argue. They won't argue. And I've told them, hey, listen, my marriage is fine. You're the one with the problem. If you want to argue, there's nothing I can do for you. Not a thing. But that's what unsurrendered lives do. When you give them the solution, give yourself to God. They won't argue. There's no hope for them. They're going to continue down that path. Give yourself to God. That's the teaching of God. That is the key for living and for serving the Lord. Give yourself to God. That is the key to a growing relationship with the Lord. Give yourself to God. That is the key to living above this world. That is the key to having God's power in your life. That is the key not to make foolish decisions. Give yourself to God. Until you do that, you don't make any decisions. That would be wise counsel. You don't, make, you, don't, I don't, you don't even decide to get up in the morning until you give yourself to God. 
because you're likely to make the wrong decision. Give yourself to God. We add to our problems by failing to give ourselves to God. This is the key to liberation. Give yourself to God. The sacrifice of self, the submission to the Lord is liberating. That's what sets us free. And we bring many a captivity in our life by refusing to surrender to the Lord. We put ourselves in many a trap. And we bring a variety of shackles and chains into our lives simply because we refuse to submit to God. Surrender to God. Moses, in the hour of crisis, Exodus thirty-two twenty-nine, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Paul said in Romans 6, 13, yield yourselves unto God. Romans 12, 1, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. The call is consecrate, yield, present, submit to God. That's the call to each one of us. And we're to do this. In every aspect, in every detail, in every circumstance of her life. You know, it shouldn't have taken Jacob 20 years to figure out, man, I should have never left. I should have never left. Well, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have married. His wife, if he didn't do that, oh, God would have arranged it. If it was God's will, he would have arranged it. And he would have saved himself a lot of time. A lot of time. Nothing about our lives is to be off limits to God. Nothing. But I dare say that every one of us, though we have not been bold enough to tell God this area is off limits to you, you stay out of this, we all have those areas. We're not honest enough to tell God that. But He knows. Nothing's to be off limits. It means every area of our life is to be lived with regard to and respect and behalf of the Lord. It means He's to be the reason. He's to be the purpose. He's to be the basis for how we conduct our lives. That's foundational. It's a foundational truth that is repeated and commanded in a variety of ways all through the Word of God. Constant surrender to God is to be our constant pursuit. It may very well save your life. Surrender to God. And it will save you. It will spare you. Many a problem. John 17, 9, we hear Jesus say, I sanctify myself. That is, I set myself apart for God's sole use. My total self. All that I am. In and of myself. I've set it all apart for God. That's what Jesus is saying. That's complete surrender. He's the only one who lived an earthly life of complete surrender. And here we are in a day when so many of God's people 
are trying to shape God around their plans, their desires, their whims, their ways, their pursuits, their recreations. And they're very good at convincing themselves that what they're doing is not wrong. They're just seeking God. But we need to come to the point when we can say, none of us have ever been there. I'm not holding anything back. Nothing. Nothing. I'm not concerned. We need to get to this point. I'm not concerned about what I can spend on me. And I'm not worried about what I can save for my personal interests. We need to get to the point. I surrender myself to God. Without any doubt. amazing just shows how dangerous we are to ourselves we very very rarely if ever trust God without doubt we'll trust ourselves without doubt we'll trust someone else without doubt without any apprehension but we can't do that with God there's always that doubt. Well, what if God doesn't do it? You don't say that about people. It just shows how dangerous we are. Oh, to feel the urgency of the matter. We resist surrender. In particular areas of our life. Because we're afraid of what might happen if I let go of this particular area of my life and just give it entirely to God. Well, what, what might happen? We fear what a life of surrender might cost. When we ought to fear what a life of unsurrender will cost. We're fearful to surrender. The terms of surrender to God are non-negotiable. One of the challenges, and we'll close, to complete surrender... It's something that bothers all of us. We don't know what lies ahead. But we want to know. Or we think we do. I want to know all the fine print. And then I'll think it over. That's human nature. Then I'll think it over. But God's way is. He gives us a blank piece of paper. And he says, sign your name at the bottom. Trust me. Well, I got to know what's going to happen. No, you don't. You don't have to know any of that. All you have to know is whatever happens, God will do what he said he would do. So you sign your name. That's surrender. That's surrender. Now, if you are buying a car or a house or anything for that matter, but and the salesman gives you a blank contract and says sign it 
I was getting ready to say no one's that foolish, but I'm sure there are people that foolish. You're not going to sign that bunk sheet of paper. But you can sign it when God hands you a blank sheet of paper. You can sign it. Why? Because you can trust him. You can't trust that salesman. You can trust God. That salesman doesn't have your best interest at heart. God does. And you can sign a blank sheet of paper. That's surrender. That's total surrender. Lord, I don't even have to know what's going to happen. I just trust you. Oh, that we would realize the danger of unsurrendered lives. We've all experienced it. We've all experienced things in our lifetime that would not have been nearly as difficult had we only listened to what God said and had we only surrendered to God. But we wanted to do something else. And the spiritual part of us, we want to be spiritual so we make sure it looks like I'm following God. But you know good and well you're not. But you do it anyway. We are a danger to ourselves. We are a danger to our family. We are a danger to everyone around us when we're unsurrendered. So God help us to live surrendered lives. Brother Ben, if you come and